My name's Ros Green, and I'm the director of the Essex Book Festival and the partner of EA Festival since it began in 2021. I'd like to welcome Tim Burrows to our joint event named after his book, The Invention of Essex. Tim writes about society, culture, and place for The Guardian, New Statesman, Vice, The Daily Telegraph, Dazed and Confused, among other top magazines and newspapers. A recurring subject in his work is Essex and the Thames Estuary. In, t in 2019, his Guardian long read, The Invention of Essex, was published to widespread acclaim and became the basis for his book. Tim, it's Hello. great to get the opportunity to talk about The Invention of Essex. I think we started talking about it, well, all things Essex, in Harwich in 2019. Yep. Um, before we get into the book... I wonder if you could define the Essex stereotype, because I believe there's some people here who are unaware of it, remarkable as that seems. <laughs> I come bearing news. Um, the Essex stereotype, I mean, there, there are a few, but if you boiled it down to something, it would probably be a, a permanently tanned person who um, makes a lot of money, um, perhaps in the city of London. And certainly in the 80s and 90s, it was um, often a man who, who voted Thatcher, bought his council house um, and had a nice motor outside um, and perhaps didn't have the biggest bookshelf in the world um, <laughs> and was often, had, often had roots in the east end of London. Um, and actually, the stereotype sort of began to evolve and remake itself in uh, after the millennium, um, after the age of uh, the dawn of reality television, um, which is when I started writing about Essex because I, I became interested in how the stereotype was, had become a bit like the Terminator in that it could never be killed. It had just <laughs> reanimated itself um, for a new generation um, with The Only Way is Essex and things like that. And I just kept noticing... Um, it, 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 I mean, Essex as a, I mean, we'll go on to talk about Essex and politics, but Essex as a kind of political trope as well, a, a kind of shorthand for a certain type of voter. Basil, Basildon Man was the sort of um, swing voter in, in the 90s. Um, how Essex had become a kind of polit important politically um, in, in the mid noughties too. So that's, that's a sort of, the Essex, you know, Essex in inverted commas in a nutshell, for anyone who doesn't know. And just Essex girls as well, I guess. We um, well, well Ess Ess Essex girls, I suppose, um, the Essex girl joke book was written under a pseudonym by uh, the, the, the tabloid journalist Richard Littlejohn. Um, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. And that's why he fled to Florida, I think. <laughs> but... Um, yeah, the Essex girl. I mean, actually, it's a, it's a, far, it's a good. I mean, it's almost its own entity, it, and it was very, quite, you know, pervasive in the culture and pretty. I mean, sexist in in its absolute essence, and it completely took hold. Um, you know, uh, it's uh, it's something. I mean, there are. You know, I don't, uh, Lots of women I know have come up against the stereotype, sort of traveling the world. My wife um, was traveling into Albania and at the checkpoint um, the guard asked where are you from and she said I'm from Essex and he said oh I've heard a lot about Essex girls <laughs> <coughs> but I'm sure you're not like that in, in a sort of broken English and so that's when you know a stereotype really has taken hold globally. Yeah exactly well the book opens with your walk home from from um, Hackney to South End. Um, Hackney was your current, your then current home. South End is where you grew up. It's a remarkably vivid and evocative piece of writing. So um, please read some of the prologue. Thanks. Thank you. Yes. <coughs> I was drawn back to Essex after the city had started to squeeze me a little too hard. I was trying to navigate the stresses of a career as a journalist in London while also attempting to figure out why I, a kid from South End, was even trying to be a journalist in London. I lived with my girlfriend Hayley in a shared house in Dalston in the east of the city, which was stuffed full of other escapees from our South Essex homeland. Most of us had met years ago in South End, either in the haze of secondary school or the stoned interregnum of sixth form. We'd all spent years solidifying our, f our friendships on the streets of Essex, in shelters by the estuary, or in the smoke-filled pubs and clubs. 
The fact we had left it behind to move to London constituted a historical irony that some elder family members had not been shy of reminding us. It was as if we had betrayed the natural order of things. The trajectory out from the great swollen city to the open county of Essex. South End was the destination of all Cockneys on a bank holiday Monday, but somehow our ancestors had never made it onto the train home. <clears throat> East London had felt less like home since the run up to the 2012 Olympics, sparked a boom in the building of luxury high rise flats that decanted council tenants to other parts of the UK. Rents were going up. Friends from Europe had to leave as the Conservative Party's austerity programme took hold and could no longer afford and they could no longer afford to build their lives there. Living in London had started to feel ever so slightly masochistic, at the mercy of, the si of a city that took pleasure in stealing your time and making you beg for each scrap of comfort. Even the things about London I had always thought I loved were turning on me. The relentlessness of its transport systems, timetables and societal pressures, all things that I, th I thought I lived for at the time, had ensnared me slowly and silently the way a boa constrictor does its prey. So I decided to walk home. With my friend Adam, I walked from East London to South End in a couple of days, leaving West Ham at dawn via a path constructed over a gigantic outfall sewer built when the area was still part of Essex. We made it out to the A13, that tarmac tributary clogged up with vans making the trip into the land of constant development, and then further into hybrid landscapes, empty of people, where reclaimed toxic dumps and landfill sites were transformed into wildlife sanctuaries. What really resonated was the sudden feeling of freedom out in the wastes between Barking, Dagenham, Raynham, Tilbury and beyond. In London, each day had become a saga of stress filled with hyper-capitalistic information overloads. These Essex walks, by comparison, were imbued with a sense of possibility and space to breathe. After the epic walk home, I planned more walks into the edges of Essex, trying to blur the boundaries between the city and home. Despite the fact I hadn't lived in Essex since my late teens, all of a sudden I couldn't stop reading about Essex walking around Essex, trawling archives for mentions of Essex, and talking about Essex. At the same time, I was starting to learn that the act of turning to the open plains and big skies of Essex as a salve for stricken city life was itself a centuries-long tradition of convalescence, away from the pressures of urban life. <clears throat> After a while, it's possible that friends were starting to question my sanity. Why was I spending all my time thinking about the county of my birth? Was I homesick? It was a possibility. Was I obsessed? I preferred to think of it as old-fashioned sleuthing, thanks. I drifted away from reviewing music for broadsheet newspapers and magazines and started to write about Essex. At the same time, Essex seemed to be taking up ever more space in British popular culture. Essex types were filling TV screens as comic staples of reality shows, such as Love Island, First Dates, Big Brother and The X Factor. One of the biggest entertainment stars working in the UK today, BBC Radio and TV presenter Ryan and Clark, shot to fame after his outlandishly Essex appearances on The X Factor and Celebrity Big Brother. Young people from Essex seem to be everywhere, performing for the camera, as if made in some marshland laboratory to meet the demands of the age of reality TV. These instant celebrities such as Joey Essex or Stacey Solomon served a dual function as heartthrob idols for teenagers to swoon over and emulate in the case of the lads copying Joey's distinctive fusy haircut, a shaven sided and long on top look, and feckless fodder for the chattering classes to laugh at. They were capable of playing it for laughs while unabash unabashedly upping their de desirability through whitened teeth and, array of and an array of cosmetic enhancements, creating a look that was simultaneously part of the joke and part of the appeal. It all seemed to confirm a truism first seeded during the brash 1980s that Essex represented an aggressive new way of living for the English lower orders. 
My new ventures into Essex reconnected me with the county I'd half remembered from my childhood. The solemn cows marooned in the beguilingly alien wasteland of Vange Marsh, strawberry picking in farms tucked away beyond the arterial roads and suburban adjuncts. St Peter on the Wall, the 7th century church in Bradwell, the county's oldest church and most sacred spot, which looks to the unsuspecting visitor like little more than an esoteric barn, dwarfed by sky where the Blackwater estuary meets the North Sea. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> I've got time for this. No, should we get... That's, yeah. yeah, cool, cool. I think that gives us a really good flavour. <clears throat> Tim, I love the title of the book, The Invention of Essex, The Making of an English County. I've been playing around with it, testing it out, taking the Essex out of the title and replacing it with words such as Somerset, Hampshire, Norfolk. And um, The Invention of Hampshire, The Making of an English County, has an entirely different ring to it. And, and it's the same with Somerset and Norfolk. Can you explain the significance of the title, the inventing part, and why the invention of Essex is so palpable and loaded? Who in your mind is doing the inventing and why are they, they doing it, past and present? Was it, as you just said, a truism cedar during the brash 1980s that, uh, as you say, that Essex represented an aggressive new way of living for the English classes, perhaps fueled in part by spitting images rogue but eminently memorable Essex's crap song, and Simon Heffer's Essex man crudely echoing Neanderthal man, or a more historical phenomenon? Um, I, I really start... I st I, the conceit of the invention, um, I, I started to write about the stereotype itself and, and as if, you know, um, to have something that's so durable like Essex Man be, be invented by a broadsheet journalist, it's sort of every journalist's dream to have <coughs> their, their creation or, you know, something that they've named, talked about in the House of Commons as Essex Man was. Um, so, in it, so in a way I started to think about it as something that was sort of plucked out and, and created like Simon Heffer is Dr. Frankenstein and uh, Essex Man is his monster. But I started to see Essex itself as being invented, really. And the Essex that we think about when we, when people who've never been to Castle Headingham before um, talk about Essex as some, something brash and, uh, and, and talk about the stereotype. Um, it's almost this place itself has invented itself because the people who live uh, in the areas that you might associate with the stereotypes, South End, where I'm from, Basildon, um, Thurrock, Billericay, um, even right up to kind of the edges of Chelmsford and perhaps, you know, other spots in Essex. <coughs> They're new places, um, and, and Essex itself is a new sort of place if we're talking about um, England uh, as, as a story. The story of Essex is very 20th century, in a way. But... Um, it, it, Essex as a, as a kind of shorthand for vulgarity and kind of aggressiveness and brashness does go further back. Um, that's another, that was kind of a surprising thing uh, about this book. Want to say something? Yeah, I mean, it's just, there, there, there were a lot, uh, kind of even before, I thought it started with the advent of the railways because I kept finding men of letters going into Essex and encountering marshland people who gave them a short shrift called them foreigners, didn't really have a great vocabulary. So you have um, Sabine Baring Gould, the uh, um, uh, ancestor of the, the Baring's family, who wrote great books about um, the marsh. Uh, uh, one was called Mahala, and it's a, it's a good sort of marshland mystery. But he was also rector of Mersey Island, and he, he had uh, quite a low opinion of the marshland people around him, and I think he kind of couldn't wait to get the hell out of there after, you know, the years that he spent there. Um, and, you know, there's a lot written about Essex people in that way. But it goes even further. I mean, you s sort of 16th century um, uh, tracts about the lowland people and how, you know, how they're a specifically obstinate kind of uh, type, which I found sort of fascinating. But yeah, and the whole, <coughs> the whole um, malaria. And well, this is well, it. I think, is quite interesting. I think this kind of feeds into... Essex uh, being a kind of specific place to be avoided, <laughs> um, in, uh, certainly in English letters, but actually in just in actually it was a life-threatening place because of this thing called the Essex Ague, which I used to think was called the Essex Ague because it's 
P, it's A, it's like plague without the P and the L on, on the ah. at the start, but you pronounce it ague. And it, back then, it was sort of as a kind of miasma um, that was associated with the I eerie marshes, but it would result in um, a very high mortality rate, especially amongst children. Um, <coughs> there were all sorts of weird kind of remedies made, and different kind of potions, like putting an onion in a glass of beer and things like that to try and ward it off. And of course, it wouldn't because what they were dealing with was actually malaria and mosquitoes spreading it. Um, but that was not really figured out for um, quite a while. So <coughs> there were parts of Essex called Kill Priest Country because priests were trying to avoid it being posted there. Um, because they would have a, a much greater chance of not surviving. And apparently servants got pl paid a lot more to go and serve lords of the manor in those kinds of um, like coastal and marshland parts of Essex. And so even then, we're talking sort of 16th century Essex, it, there's already this sort of narrative forming. And then there's um, rubbish. Yeah. <laughs> you write a lot about Essex as a physical dumping ground. Yeah. The unacceptable and yet accepted levels of toxic waste lurking below the surface on Lee Marshes, the toxic air particles in Thurrock, the notion of a wasteland, or as you say, the haunting of waste in the future. And with that, the notion of Essex as a kind of, this is your words, a kind of colony of London for its undesirables, including the vast tracts of shit. It's not a pretty picture and completely man-drawn. How much do you think this has fed into the uh, idea of Essex's crap? Well, it, I mean, this song Essex's crap is, is like kind of perfect, really. I mean, I actually, I, I tracked down the bloke who wrote it for Spitting Image, and he was, he was kind of gutted that I pinned it to him because he said it, it definitely wasn't his best work. He told me. <laughs> I mean, he's he's writing musicals with Harry Hill now. I just think you know. Um, so I won't. I think his name's Steve Brown, but you know, <laughs> don't don't track him down. <laughs> but just that idea of. Um, Essex as a dumping ground, uh, I mean, is real. Like, um, Th Thurrock and Essex, uh, well, actually, or, or, I mean, lots lots of parts of South Essex, where I'm from, around sort of South End, Leon Sea, Hadley, uh, any, any part that's sort of marshy, really, um, especially in the South, it was used to deal with what had become a big problem. It's like, what do you do with London's waste? Um, you dump it in a far away and out the way place these days that is unfortunately you know taken to a country uh, with a, a lower GDP than, <laughs> than the West um, but then it was take it to an area that was that was thought that no one would ever really find out or, or, or not find out but <coughs> realize what was happening here um, and actually some of these places um, so uh, mucking marsh which was the biggest landfill in Europe in, in its before then it was known as an ancient um, site in, in Thurrock. It, it, it just creates a kind of, I mean, I call it a Brecon beacon of waste in the book because it creates this sort of very unnatural hillside. And you get these hillsides um, on, in Thames Estuary Essex where it's quite confusing. You sort of grow up thinking there are hills I on floodplains and no one talks about them because nobody wants to talk about the fact that you have sort of a century's worth of crap. <laughs> as as part of your um, horizon. Um, it's only now, I mean, I sort of went on a on a walk uh, on the coastline in Tilbury um, with K Dr. Kate Spence, who actually went out, uh, who talked to Panorama and made a program with her about coastal landfill quite recently. And um, she was sort of showing me the amount of asbestos that's coming out of these sort of like hillsides of um, of rubbish because of the erosion. Um, but it's so it's only now, really, and I think that's the thing about Essex, uh, in, in that you can see um, uh, the ills of modernity. Uh, they are there in your face, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. And I think the up, the maybe the upside is a bit of a kind of positive spin. But um, out of that, there are people sort of dealing with this stuff now and realising it's there and trying to figure out what to do because it's not just a problem in Essex of course it's a problem all around Europe this sort of coastal erosion but and and in Essex uh, there's a huge conservation drive the Essex Wildlife Trust is has the most members of any wildlife trust um, and there is a realization that because I mean largely it's because of the amount of people who live in uh, especially South Essex it sort of mirrors London because Essex is there because 
of the, the housing disaster of industrial London, really. And so you needed to kind of escape that. Um, but, it, but, but because of that, because all, all of the dwellings built in, in places like Canvey Island or the, the huge su suburban um, sprawl of, of South Essex is that you just have so many people. So you have their rubbish, but you also have the people to sort of deal with it. Yeah. Well, I want to talk about something else that isn't crap and <laughs> the rubbish side of it, something, something that I'm quite passionate about. Essex, as you say, is a very fluid liminal place, not only in terms of its geography, the Razor Edge coastline, which is constantly remaking mm. and reinventing itself, but also in terms of its multiple identities. Um, I'm very aware of this, given that the Essex Book Festival has a license to roam, and unlike other literary book festivals, we go all over the county. Um, one of the Essex I identities you talk about in this fabulous book is um, Radical Essex, uh, and it's something that's deeply embedded in the Essex Book Festival. Can you say something about Radical Essex? Because people always laugh at that too. When I go on about Radical Essex, right. they go, ha, 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 ha. Well, I think Radical Essex was a, a genius phrase that I think was invented by someone at Focal Point Gallery about, I don't know, yeah. was it, yeah, I mean, there was a, there was a, a big... Because it's not just, uh, I think what happened, the stereotype showed its head again in the 2010s, and I think it sort of had this artistic reaction to it. So I kind of started writing about it, but lots of local artists started making work and looking at Essex anew. And there was the uh, project called The Peculiar People, um, and then there was this project called Radical Essex, and it was a decision to um, group together all of the... Um, I, don't, I don't even think it counters the Essex stereotype in some way because it just is, again it's Essex as this place that's sort of countering the, the the kind of more traditional English or British narrative in that Essex for centuries really is a place where you would have quite radical experimentation. Um, you'd have Tolstoyan communities. I don't know if anyone here knows the writer Ken Warpole, um, but he's written at length about um, the uh, tradition of colonizing um, Essex, because Essex in, in the 19th century was quite an empty place. The agricultural depression had particularly taken hold and actually started earlier in Essex. And so you have farmers, especially South Essex, again, because of um, London clay. Uh, but you have farmers who are sort of giving up and selling off their land cheaply. And you would have a capitalistic reaction to that, but you'd also have this radical reaction where people could get hold of land and start up. I mean, the first nudist colony in the UK uh, starts in Wickford, um, <laughs> which Wickford's very proud of. Um, <laughs> um, and, but as well as that, you have, uh, because of all of this land and all of this, um, <coughs> which is in the air, globe, I mean, it's in the air through Europe, but this, how do we answer the, first the ravages of capitalism and industrialization, but also increasingly as we go through the 20th century, the ravages of war. I mean, there are, I mean I've, I've driven through Silver End today. That's a part of Radical Essex. That is some, a worker, worker town based on, well, various worker town models, but um, the architect architecturally that is such a kind of forward-thinking European modernism that's in Silver End. Um, uh, and, and as anyone, if anyone hears from Silver End knows, you, you can't, get double glazing there because all your windows are listed because it was the Crittle Window Company that built that town. And you have East Tilbury, you have the Barter um, Worker Town there, which was... And these towns didn't just sort of build the houses. They kept a kind of sense of, you know, the, commu the workers' community um, pro providing leisure. Apparently in East Tilbury there, w there was music <laughs> piped through speakers as everyone went to work in the morning <laughs> sort of thing which does sound slightly it's on the very edge of like radicalism into dystopianism uh, uh, but um but also i mean the peasants revolt is a, is, is a form of this kind of quite sparky um against type again again i mean you know against the part of the state that's holding them down in a way and and trying to trying to gain freedom from serfdom they were, but, you know, th this attempt to do something new and try and remake the world in, in this place. What about Basildon and <coughs> Harlow? Well, yeah, I mean, th I mean, I think the new... Utopian... Yeah, the new towns, I think, are kind of the culmination of architectural utopianism, really. Um, certainly Harlow, the legacy um, is there 
for you to see better in Harlow, perhaps, and you can access it if you go to the Gibbard Gallery um, in Harlow, um, which is basically f the master planner who designed Harlow. And, and Harlow was a place that was really remarked upon for be being a very generous new town. I mean, the green spaces that were built, um, there's a lot of thought put into it by Gibbard and his team. He ends up living on the edge of Harlow for his whole life and, and sort of just starts to pilfer huge sculptures from <laughs> uh, some of his projects in different parts of the country. So he's got the, I think he knocked down a bank in the city and he has, I think it's a Lloyd's, a column of Lloyd's Bank is just sitting in this sort of um, garden in Harlow now. You can go and see it. But, and Basildon too, I mean, I think Basildon actually has such a bad rep, but if you, architecturally, it still holds up just about as much as the local authority uh, hasn't really respected um, it's, its centre for years now, but it still holds up as a place, I think. Um, um, and, 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 they, and they were built to, well, to, sol to solve huge housing issues after the Second World War. And it, but it wasn't just the war, it wasn't just the Blitz. You, you have um, this movement called the Plotland Movement, where people move out into fields. And this is another aspect of the, um, the influence of the Depression. Farmers were selling their fields off to developers, and before developers actually made the streets themselves, they sold them directly to people to build their own homes. They're often rectangular homes that were quite easy. Sometimes they came in kits, but they're quite easy to build. Door in the middle, two windows either side. Maybe put some pebble dash up. Do it as groups in, in you know, uh, you know, sort of a carpenter builder. Do it in groups. Do all the house on the street, and that's what I um, learned that my great granddad did and that's how my father's mother sort of comes to grow up in a, a w almost a woodland clearing that becomes a housing estate in in, in Essex um, and then the new towns because that's so popular the downside of that as you might see there's, there have been issues with Jaywick um, which was it's one of the most enduring Plotland settlements Th all of the roads weren't really kept by the council there wasn't any sanitation wasn't really proper running water or anything like that. You had wells and things like that. If you have that in a scale of tens of thousands of people, as you did in the Basildon area, there is a huge problem. And so that's why Billericay Council were the only council to jump at the chance of a new town, because most councils were like this, if a new town was coming towards them. But Billericay had a problem to solve. So, But that, I mean, it's, it's people always making these movements in and creating this, this spark, really. <coughs> and I, I mean, I'm kind of intrigued because it's the invention of Essex. I'm kind of thinking about the reinvention of Essex and constantly it's reinventing itself. But, you know, we're here at this festival with you and lots of artists and writers. And it's, I it's interesting, the historical representations. I've always kind of believed that Constable was painting his time as mm. it was. And do you want to say something about that? Because that's a bit of a revelation. Uh... Or well, c yeah, I mean, basically, I, I, there's this, I started to become fascinated by Constable, and partly because I kept being told I had to write about Constable Country, because I was sullying Essex's name by writing about the south of the county and, and the stereotype. Um, so I, I sort of visited Dedham Vale a few times and became sort of a bit obsessed with Constable in the way, well, almost the twin way that he, he sought to depict a kind of very... He was obsessed with clouds. He was obsessed with the way they changed. He was trying to capture the change all the time. But also, at the way he painted Dedham Vale, it was a sort of very nostalgic um, treatment he gave it, I mean, uh, remembering from his childhood. And I think the, th the, thre the double threat of development that was coming um, at the time, you know, it wasn't on the horizon, but that idea um, that things might change, but plus the, the advancement of the French and perhaps, you know, N uh, Napoleon sort of like w um, winning the war um, created this sort of um, I don't know perhaps nostalgic sense of a timeless place and I just found it I don't know I find it I found it really quite ironic that the success of Constable um, at that time created a place that won't ever change now because of it's an area of outstanding natural beauty so it's it's it has become timeless. I mean, his wish was fulfilled in a way. And uh, I talked to 
um, the writer, he, he goes by the name of Old Weird Albion on Twitter, um, Justin Hopper. He's a, he's a Michigan fish out of water who lives in Dedham Vale. And he, and he kind of thinks a lot and writes a lot about Dedham. But he calls um, the Dedham area of outstanding natural beauty like the greatest um, artwork ever made, in a way, because it's, because it's, it's one artist's vision of a place that, that cannot um, change. I mean, that was in reaction to North Essex could have become South Essex, actually, I mean, in a sense, because you have all of these sort of developments that are earmarked for, for that... Um, for Dedham Vale and its surrounds, and they almost get built, and but there's a huge kind of pushback, and there's a success, and so now we have, instead of um, Dedham Vale being a kind of bitty, so, sort of partially industrialised, partially suburban landscape that's very familiar in England, we have somewhere that's kept, but kept for people to visit and see, you know, to to show them this is England, but then rush them away very quickly afterwards. Um, yeah. But I, do, I, I do think there is a, I don't know, there's a second book to be written on North Essex, for sure, as well. Th there is, but also going back to the artists and the writers, and this is my last question, um, is, is how people enter a place remotely via, you know, films, books, whatever. I, I mean, I, I mean, I've, I was in mm. Lagos attending an event there, and I was with a festival director from Newcastle in Australia, New South Wales. And I said, what do you know about Essex? So I was thinking, okay, it's going to be Essex Girls straight away, just it. Yeah. And, and, um, and she said, well, I really want to go there because of the Essex Serpent, because I read yeah. Sarah Perry's book, and it just sounds like somewhere completely alien and yeah. different and mythical and magical. And she wants to come to Essex on the basis of that book. And then my sister-in-law, who lives in Auckland, rang my partner this morning, and the first thing I heard was him saying, do you know something about this book that Margaret Myers has written? It's just at the Auckland Literary Festival, and it's about the Essex Witches. Mm. What, you know, does Ros know about the Essex Witches? And I was thinking, again, another really yeah. powerful narrative. And I'm just saying, I, you know, I think if we want to reinvent Essex or be part of the process, then the artists and the writers and the filmmakers and everyone have actually got quite a powerful weaponry there. And, uh, well, what I find so, I love, I love the Essex Serpent, and I think it was quite a revelation reading that because um, I was sort of at the start of looking at the idea and, and this idea of the city and the country, really. And I think Essex tells the story how those things bleed together in the 20th century, but, but even in the 19th century where... Um, the, the book is set. Yeah. You just have you have this sort of out of time place. Um, I can't remember the village now, but uh, where, where uh, it's, it's, it's Molden, isn't it? It's sort of a kind of black water estuary kind of place, Tom which Tom doesn't feel so. You can find places like that still in Essex too. Definitely. And this this idea of you're going to and from the city by train, and there's this great modernity in it. But there's also this, but but it's almost like Essex becomes. The place where London still finds the old, old ways like that, and and there's quite a it's such it's a real place of juxtapositions like that. And so I found, um, I don't know, fa I found it hugely thrilling to read that. But yeah, I mean, the more the merrier, I think. Well, exactly, and just throwing down the gauntlet, like you know, we can we can reimagine. We can. Well, re I think there are lots and, <laughs> but I mean, the next uh, there's so much being made now. Yeah. I mean, and Essex is always changing. <laughs> And whether you like it or not, it's often because of London and, you know, uh, the... Connectivity. Yeah. So, <coughs> um, questions. We've got hands going up. Um, microphones will come to you. Please don't, sp please don't speak until... Don't ask your question until you've... Gentleman at the front. Sorry, I'm hopeless at this. You can give a name. Okay. Hi, um, my name's Wilfred. Um, Hi, Wilfred. Um... Do you think the Essex spirit has always been there? Because um, you've had Bodicea back in the Roman days, and and also I know a little bit about New England in America, in Massachusetts, and I think a lot of the Puritans come, came from Essex. Yeah. So do you think that adversity actually then forms a spirit of adventure you know and what? resilience? I, I thought that's going to be really hard to prove, and I didn't really... I don't know if I prove it in this book, but I do spend a lot of time talking about how marshland and living, because I, I haven't talked in this talk about also 
the, the Essex struggle with water and, and the tides and flooding. And there is, there's a sort of constant battle with the sea. And there's a kind of very practical relationship with where you live. I mean, it's a, lot of, a lot of it's kind of hard to farm. Um, and uh, perhaps you are having to you know, build up. There, there was this thing called the law of the marsh where you was, were responsible for building up the sea wall for each section. Um, and th there's this sort of practicality, this sort of like, we just have to get on with it and we have to... Um, and the, the characteristics of the Puritanism, there is a lot written about how you wouldn't get that type of person from, um, say, you know, up, up a mountain or in, in with, you know, at the top of a huge valley looking out or, or in the Lake District or in these places that were loved by the Romantics. There, there is a... But I, I didn't, I didn't, you know, I don't think I really set out to. Com I, I'd love to. I mean, almost that's a PhD, isn't it? It's like the ge geography behind Puritanism, and I think maybe that would be a really fascinating thing to do. But it's certainly historical um, hints at what you're s what you're saying, um, for sure. The gentleman in the middle behind, Nicholas. Do you think that those extraordinary characters in the books by Ben Susan, those sort of marshland tales, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Do, you, do you think they sort of, uh, I mean, they, they've rather vanished from view now? I absolutely love, he's, I, I don't think I quote him directly in this book, but I have done before, and I, I found his depictions of the Denji when, and they sort of mirrored, because I was from Essex, he wasn't, he, was, he wrote for Vanity Fair and places like that, and he, um, I don't. Have you read a biography of him? Because I've only read his writing. But anyway, S. L. Ben Susan is this writer who um, he kind of typifies um, the, the the sort of journalist who gets bewitched by the Essex marshes. He ends up moving out there, um, and he constantly depicts them as people who are very suspicious <laughs> of anyone coming off the train dressed very nicely. And I guess he took a while to you know, for him to trust him. And there's, there's such a, I mean, it's almost like anthropological. It's almost like he's on, some going into some distant land. And they're, very, they're like a closed shop, aren't they? And they have this word foreigners for anybody who comes from the next village or beyond. It's like anyone who's like beyond the next village. Um, I found some people like that in the Denji. And I actually was going to write a lo lot more on, on that sort of like... Um, uh, just suspicious, um, just want to get on with their own thing, and how that has survived in, in po pockets. And I think it can survive in Essex, because although it's very modernised, I think the arterial roads and everything, can't, they can't go everywhere. The rivers keep, you know, I mean, the Denji Peninsula, I mean, although that is being built into, it still retains a kind of... Um, you know, and out, it's out the way. Not p nobody travels through the Denji Peninsula anywhere, and so I have. I got introduced to somebody who who was generation, generation, generation all the way back. <laughs> I mean, you, d you do call it bigotry these days, but <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, it wa it wa it's not so charming. But it's sort of like he didn't want to know about anybody outside the Denji, and I got I interviewed him at length, but it didn't. I didn't, yeah, it, <laughs> it, it was kind of, it was like, you know, if, 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 if your father's father's father wasn't born here, you're, you're kind of new, you know. <laughs> you can still find that in Essex. Uh, Other questions? Hands? Gentleman at the back in the bluey green shirt. Um, Tim, I, I wanted to ask you about uh, a lot of the great bounds that have come out of Essex uh, from... Depeche Mode to, yeah. to Crass. Yeah, yeah. And, and I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit about your favourite bands and why you think possibly they have come from Essex. Yeah, uh, I love that question because I do write about Essex music in the book. Um, it, again, it's, uh, it's, all, it's always a story of either escape to or escape from. So, so, so some of my favourite bands are from Basildon and they are um, Depeche Mode, Yazoo, um, so Alison Moye and Vince Clark at the heart of these things. They, none of them live in Basildon anymore, you might, you might not be surprised to know. Um, but there was this idea that, and I, I'm a great advocate for um, 
um, projects of renewal uh, of housing, you know. So, so bring on a kind of a new look at what we can do for, you know, the country in the form of a new town or whatever. But the, the flip side of that is you, you do get a lot of people thinking, I don't want to work at the factory that my dad did. And, and so you have these clusters of artists or musicians who, that was all often the story of people who were bo kind of bored of that sort of like trajectory. So that's the story of Vince Clark in Depeche Mode. Or, but they create this fantastically modern music. Um, there's a sort of fearlessness, perhaps because, I mean, you have d d um, Dr. Philgood from Canvey Island before that, I mean, who are um, said to be the sort of like origins of punk with Wilco Johnson and his guitar. Um, I mean, there's a sort of fearlessness there. There's also the fact that London is just there, and you can go, music journalist, I know you don't like to get too far out, but we're only half an hour away on the train, do you want to come and watch us play? And we can get to London, and you can sell yourself as a kind of Essex band that way. And I think Crass, are, Crass were the opposite, weren't they? They were like escape from, they were kind of hiding out in a, in a, in a kind of home on, on the edge of Epping Forest, isn't it? <laughs> but again, it's like, um, I, th I mean, I don't know how they really m meet those two bands, but they do feel like there is a kind of, you know, I don't know, um, s s sort of, they don't really mind that they're, they're different and they're making something that's countering. But that's very Essex. Essex. Yeah, perhaps. Essex yeah. is bold and it is, you know, it's not, I'm actually from Suffolk. <laughs> <laughs> As the director of the Essex Book Festival, but my my feeling in Essex is that Essex, the Essex character is 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 quite is quite fearless, is quite bold, is prepared to take risks. That's something that I feel quite strongly yeah. about the Essex character. Massive generalisation, obviously, yeah. but that is that's my observation. And we've got time for one more question. That hand went up first. <laughs> um, Essex is a very large county. And you have alluded to there being a north and south. <laughs> it's north, do south, you think, right. Yeah. Do you think they're almost separate counties? Do they have more different about each other or more in common, the north and the south? It's, it is odd. It's all about London Overspill, really, isn't it? Because I think Clacton and South End are like estranged brothers or something. Um, and you, they are very different. But geolo geologically, they're different, aren't they, with the different clays? And they're split. Um, by by maybe by the the Blackwater maybe I don't know I mean <coughs> Chelm is Chelmsford the is Chelmsford the gateway or is is, is I mean Mid Essex is sort of around there I don't know I mean because you start to that, I mean north of Chelmsford people wonder if they're in East Anglia or not south they <laughs> never ask the question I suppose. Um, <laughs> But um, certainly, I don't know. What would you think? What would be the what would be the percentage if they had a referendum um, <laughs> on whether you'd want to split, you know, split them apart? I mean, I know North Essex doesn't really like the stereotype, and South Essex <laughs> sees it as a business opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think that's a, a, a brilliant way to end. This. <laughs> And there's clearly work to be done. Yeah. <laughs> so I like bring the two together. So, you know, we'll keep on talking about this. Tim, thank you so much for this. Thank um, you. Cheers. Thank you.